Hello, everybody. Thanks for joining us. Uh, I'm Russ Berlingabe from comicbook.com, and we are here today for a spotlight panel on Mark Guggenheim. Now, Mark, you probably know as the writer on TV shows like Arrow and Troll Hunters, movies like Percy Jackson and, well, Troll Hunters, uh, <laughs> and, uh, and a ton of comic books. Uh, and and that's uh, one of the first things I want to say, Mark, is thank you so much for taking the time out. Oh, well, thank you for taking the time. Thanks for no, agreeing absolutely. to moderate this. I really appreciate it, man. Yeah. Uh, and, and the second thing I want to say is that uh, I think the, the panel description needs a little bit of work because uh, I, I, I'm one of those guys, I'm going to die on the hill, that uh, Overwatch is a gem. Oh, so, I oh, appreciate uh, that. Really appreciate that. What, um, jump, before we get jump into kind of comparing and contrasting the, the different media, which is kind of the idea here, what was it about that moment in your career that made it feel like, okay, now is the time to write a novel? Uh, great question. Um, you know, the funny thing is, is that the, the novel got finished and published like a couple of years, like three years after I started it. Um, and so it made more sense to do back when I started, which was I had just finished up uh, a deal at ABC Studios and six years at ABC Network. Um, I was, I was quote unquote, taking the year off. I, I decided I wasn't going to staff. Uh, I, at the time, didn't even have any sort of develop, TV development in the works. I just wanted to sort of concentrate on writing movies and, uh, and, and other things, uh, including comic books. And I thought this is, this is the best possible moment for me to write a novel. So what I did was I used that time uh, to write the first half of Overwatch. Then I sold it and then sort of, very contemporaneous with that, we launched Arrow. Uh, and that's why I was, you know, working on an Overwatch during the third season of Arrow. So it took, took quite a bit of time. Actually, it was like four years total. So um, it, it, it seemed like a good idea at the time, but then it became less of a good idea the more busier I got. Well, I remember when the book came out and you had the San Diego panel that uh, you and I were talking kind of off mic about the Suicide Squad in Arrow and then the Suicide Squad movie and everything that was so it, it feels like a very specific time in my brain. <laughs> Mine too actually and that was a fun panel I really yeah. enjoyed that. Uh, I still have the, the audio somewhere I'll have to share it with you. Oh gosh yes yeah, so uh, share my nasally voice with the world. <laughs> well you worked on uh, in addition to Overwatch you worked on some of the Arrow novels I actually have one of these back here. Yeah. Uh, uh, what having done kind of TV and comics and novels with these characters, would you be interested in trying to take the, those versions of these characters into a feature at some point? That's interesting. Um, I think so. I, I, I do love these characters and I do like miss working in this world. Um, you know, with, with the end of Arrow uh, and finishing off Crisis on Infinite Earths, uh, I basically, you know, decided that the, a chapter has been closed here and, you know, sticking around, you know, it, it didn't seem like, I've, done, I've said all I'm gonna say, at least for now, with these characters in this medium. So I've, I've decided to sort of, you know, move on from the Arrowverse. By now, everyone knows that I'm involved in the Green Lantern uh, launch for HBO Max. So I'm not going too far away, uh, but I am, um, you know, stepping aside from the Arrowverse for the time being. What? What is the difference between uh, when you're writing a feature versus when you're, I know you don't write every line of it, but when you're mastering one of these giant interconnected events that basically is a three hour movie? You know, I'll tell you, it's, it's a good question. Um, you know, the difference really, I think, comes down to like the way, like when I'm doing Crisis or any of the crossovers, for example, the way I work with the showrunners is it's a, it's a very sort of, um, I want to say it's a delicate dance, but that implies that everyone's difficult to deal with and that's not at all true. Everyone's like wonderful. But I feel very strongly having been someone who's run these shows that my job is not to come in and dictate anything to any of the other showrunners. If, if someone was doing that to me, I would find it really, really obnoxious and annoying. Um, so when I'm doing the crossovers or when I did the crossovers, I have to start using the past tense. Um, I, you know, my, I felt like my goal was to help provide a rubric or a structure um, that 
the different showrunners could come in and sort of hang their various ornaments on um, and, and just really sort of help in terms of like moving the, the dialogue forward, both in terms of breaking story and in terms of how do we actually produce this monstrosity? <laughs> um, you know, and that, that's its own little trick. Um, but it's a very different endeavor than when I'm say writing a movie where it's just me in a room when I'm writing a movie. I mean, yes, I'll, I'll do it in conjunction with producing partners and whatnot uh, and studio execs and everyone, you know, has ideas and notions, but uh, even on movies where I've got a director attached, at the end of the day, it is just me alone at the keyboard. Um, so it's a very different uh, type of experience. And kind of continuing in the feature, uh, feature vein, you and Greg obviously are credited on the Green Lantern movie, and now you're writing the show. Yes. Uh, We're returning to the scene of the crime. <laughs> well, I mean, obviously, I, I assume it's going to be somewhat different, but when you're tackling the same IP for TV and film. Uh, what are the big difference in terms of breaking story? Well, you know, for, I, I happen to believe, and, and, you know, this is not a universally held opinion. I happen to believe that you can't do a 10 hour show or an eight hour show um, or an eight episode show, I should say, um, like an eight hour movie. I don't, I don't think that works. I think when you, when I've seen it done, um, there's always like some flabby episodes in the middle. Um, so I do think you have to approach it like a TV series and approach each episode as its own entity, even though it's streaming, even though hopefully people will binge it. Um, you've got to make each episode a satisfying meal and you've got to, you know, look at it with a different kind of tempo than you would have in a two hour movie. Um, you know, that being said, you know, certainly the show for HBO Max that, that we're all working on, we are approaching it with the production ambitions of a movie. Um, so we're, we're writing it like a TV show, but we're hoping to produce it like a film. Uh. This, this is a question that uh, we hadn't kind of discussed, but I wanted to slip in. Uh, because you directed uh, an episode of Legends this year, which by the way was such a delightful hour of television. Uh, uh, I, I feel like, because you told me at the time you didn't want to do a superhero feature right away. And so probably Green Lantern is a little bit uh, elevated for what you want to do. But will kind of the scope and ambition of Green Lantern prevent you from directing anytime soon? Or are you going to try to do that some more? Um, you know, I think, I think it's like in the short term, yes. In in the short term, um, you know, I feel like that's that's a much bigger you know bite to take out uh, than I could probably convince the the studio to let me, or I would even necessarily want to. Um, but who knows? You know what the future holds. If you know if Green Lantern runs ten seasons, um, you know, I would say anything's possible. Now. It's tempting to say that TV and comics share a lot of DNA because they're open-ended and they have the serialized format and a lot of cliffhangers. What do you think for you are the biggest differences in writing for the two different formats? Okay, well, you know, full disclosure, you did provide me with the questions before our panel. Uh, and I've been thinking a lot about this one because I get asked this question. This is probably the question I get asked the most, which is what are the differences between writing for tell film and writing for comics? And I always give the same answer because it's always true, you know, budgets are different, you know, in a comic book, you're limited only by what the artist can draw, blah, blah, blah. But thinking on it some more, because I, I, I didn't want to just sort of give you the, the pat, you know, wrote boilerplate answer that I typically give. I was, I realized the way I tell a story in the medium of comics versus the way I tell a story in the medium of film is, is very different. Um, it's, you know, in comic books, you're, because you are dealing with the static image, each panel doesn't move, right? It has to be frozen in time. You are, you're writing even the action stuff with a different sense of pacing. Um, and that part of that pacing is the way the panels are laid out on the page and the way you know, you're telling story from page to page, you know, you know, I think good comic book writers, um, they write with their page terms in mind. 
and they write with the reveals of when you when you turn an even numbered page to reveal an odd numbered page that is that's a that's a reveal to the audience um, that is something that hopefully you're, you're taking advantage of that tool in your toolbox. You have very different tools in your toolbox when you're dealing with TV or film. Um, but I realized that because of those different mediums, I'm basically telling the stories in very different ways. Um, and I, I would tell the story, you know, I might tell the same story in two different mediums, but I, the way that story gets unfolded to the reader or the audience, depending, uh, would be very, very different. Now, kind of backpedaling a little bit to go back to my first question about timing. Uh, you're, you're a former lawyer and you've done legal and political dramas, things that seem really in your wheelhouse as a former lawyer. Uh, you left that behind to jump on su superheroes at a time when superheroes weren't the only thing on TV, uh, right. which now <laughs> that they are, you seem very smart. <laughs> um, lucky, uh, very lucky. What, yeah, what, what kind of motivated that? Was it just that you loved the content? Was it Greg? What was it that got you uh, off on yeah, arrow at that moment? It was both. Uh, it, it was both, actually. It's, it's funny. Uh, it just looks smart in hindsight. But the truth of the matter is, is that um, I was developing two pilots the year we developed Arrow. Uh, I developed Arrow with Greg, but I was also developing a legal show um, uh, under Greg's banner. Um, and it just so happened that Arrow went and the legal show did not, but I could have just as easily found myself back uh, in the law world. What, what's kind of funny uh, about the question uh, is, is the particular timing right now, which is, like I said, I'm stepping away from the Arrowverse. I'm, I'm still keeping a, a foot in the DC universe with Green Lantern, but over the quarantine, I wrote a spec feature that's a legal drama and uh, I'm also in the process of, of pitching a law show. Uh, so I, I've gone back to my roots really uh, and started um, playing around uh, with uh, these, you know, these tropes, these legal drama tropes that I haven't, ex I haven't exercised those muscles in any significant way for about 10 years now. So it's, uh, it's a little bit like going home. I do think it's beholden on you to, to get George Michael for the pilot if it, if it goes. <laughs> um, it, it, he would be a real get considering <laughs> he's dead. Uh, yeah, but I, I, yes. I, I forgot about that. Uh, <laughs> no, it's all um, good. Well, I mean, it's funny, Greg and I were actually talking about George the other day um, yeah. and uh, just reminiscing very fondly about him um, because that was such a, a lucky you know, turn of events. Um, and I remember <laughs> that, uh, you know, in trying to get George for the pilot, um, Greg flew to Dallas, which is where George was living at the time. And, um, you know, was walking around his house and talking to George and he put, uh, like, yeah, I think he had a glass of ice water that George had given him and he put it on top of, you know, this upright piano. Yeah. And, uh, his boyfriend just took the glass and said, um, John Lennon wrote Imagine on that piano. <laughs> Um, and, uh, just George was just such a great, you know, down to earth guy, despite being, you know, incredibly successful and incredibly famous. Uh, one of the things that I think is really interesting about the Arrowverse that even though obviously you are using familiar IP, you did blaze your own path for quite a while. Nice. Um, your last major project though was crisis and you had to deal with like the Brandon Routh Superman and the Smallville character. Like, is there a challenge to making either a sequel or a follow-up or something where you're basically using somebody else's version of an established character versus being able to create one from full cloth? I would say uh, for sure. And I'm, I'd say the biggest challenge, quite frankly, is making sure you're not screwing it up. Um, you know, again, approaching crisis, you know, with as much sort of empathy as I can muster, um, yeah, I would be really annoyed if someone took one of my characters and didn't do right by them. Uh, so first and foremost, you know, we, we really applied the Hippocratic Oath to all the cameos and all the, you know, various non-Arrowverse elements to it, which is do no harm. Uh, make sure that we are, you know, presenting these characters in a way that really honors them and honors their legacy. Um, hopefully we, we were successful and that we did that. Uh as a as a kind of 
piggybacking on that is the idea that you don't have to rely on anybody, whether it's the previous canon or, or collaborators. Uh, part of the appeal of doing novels, because again, it's even when you're doing your feature and you're alone at the keyboard, eventually it has to go to a director. Right. I always say, you know, everything exists along a continuum of collaboration. Um, you know, with a film, that's probably the height of collaboration. You have the biggest cast, the biggest crew, television, you know, very, very closely related to that. And then the opposite end of the spectrum, you have a, a novel, you have prose where you are responsible for everything. You are, you are the writer, yes, but you're also the director, you're the cinematographer, you are the costume designer, you are the production designer. You are responsible for everything, which is both wonderful and horrible at the same time. Um, I've been, you know, working up notes for a potential uh, second novel. Um, and the idea of returning to prose is very enticing to me, not really because I just enjoy doing it myself. Um, like I said, there's pros and cons to that. But uh, I, I like, you know, I like, just like the way I like telling stories in comic books, I enjoy the freedom uh, that comes with telling a story in prose. Uh First of all, I'm gonna, I want to say that we're going to have people talking about the pros of pros and the, the pros and cons. I know, the uh, pros and cons. <laughs> ah, it's too complicated. Uh, during, during that spotlight panel that I alluded to a few years back, uh, we talked about that issue of Marvel Comics Presents that you colored and how like doing one of those jobs that writers don't typically do, editors don't typically do, gave you a real appreciation for the production people and for kind of the nuts and bolts of comics. Uh, did you have something similar in film and television? Like where are the areas where you, you were like, oh, I really learned something that I wouldn't necessarily have learned if I didn't bumble into this one thing? Oh, I mean, well, for certain, uh, directing was a massive learning experience. It, it really was like a, it was film school, you know, writ large. Um, and I learned, I learned so, so much, despite the fact that I've been writing in television for 20 years now. And, you know, when you see the way the sausage gets made from a very different perspective, you know, I'd been on a million sets and I'd watched, you know, hundreds of thousands of hours of television be shot, uh, but to actually be the director calling, you know, action and cut and being, you know, the one ultimately responsible for all the creative decisions, um, that was, it was really eye-opening. I have to say it was eye-opening in a great way. It was incredibly invigorating. Um, I, I really got excited and truth be told, uh, if not for COVID, I really wanted to uh, direct again this year. It just seems like I'll have to wait a little longer before I get another opportunity. Uh, that said, it seems like you've been super productive during the pandemic. Uh, you know, everybody knows that you're doing profit, which Rob seems to be just over the moon about. And he's, been he's been really, really kind. And I'm having a blast working on it. Uh, it's, that's a really, it's a great property. It's been a great project. Rob is a delight. Um, his, his enthusiasm is incredibly infectious. Um, so yeah, that's been a lot of fun. I'm, I'm in the process of starting my second draft uh, as we speak. Uh, but post COVID uh, with, you know, obviously Regal closed again and that kind of shook the industry all over again. And we've got, all of the stuff that's moving to streaming and yet Disney made this big move and CBS made a big move a few weeks back, et cetera, et cetera. Um, as somebody who has moved pretty recently from traditional broadcast into streaming, uh, do you have any insight as far as kind of what the key differences are in the landscape that we're kind of looking at in the next couple of years? I, I tell you, the, the, all, the answer to that question is it will change and change and change again. By the time I even finished answering, it probably would have changed. <laughs> um, the, the truth is, it is very much the Wild West. Um, in, in, uh, you know, in a bad sense, sure, but I think in very good sense. Because um, I feel like in the Wild West, you had you know, gold uh, prospecting and there's opportunity in uncertainty and there's opportunity in change. And I'm, I'm very excited about the fact that, you know, streaming is, it's kind of opening up um, the paradigm in terms of storytelling. You know, we're no longer, it used to be that you could tell a story in two hours uh, as a movie or 22 hours as a season of network television. 
Now you can tell a story in three hours, four hours, 13 hours. Um, you really can change things to fit the you know, idea that you're trying to get out. Um, and look, there's various different, you know, professional uh, benefits and hazards uh, attendant to it. Uh, for example, I think there is a, you know, there, there's a slightly disturbing trend for networks and platforms to look at an eight hour series as an eight hour movie and to treat the writer accordingly. Um, and that is, that is, I'm here to tell you, bad. Um, it's bad. Well, it's certainly bad for TV writers. Uh, it's, it's particularly bad for feature writers trying to work in television um, because I don't think any feature writer will tell you, you know what, I really want to be treated, I really want to be treated this way in, in television uh, as well. It's, it's not great. Um, so I think, you know, it's a tricky it's a tricky time that we're in because there is so much uncertainty. And, and obviously when you throw in the uncertainty of COVID and the effect it's had on the theatrical business, um, look, I don't want to see theatrical releases go away. And truth be told, I don't really think that they ultimately will. I do think they may change. It may change sort of how movies get distributed, when they get distributed and what types of movies get released into theaters. But you know, we're living in a moment in time right now. And eventually, I know it doesn't feel this way, eventually that moment is gonna be over and life will not return to normal over overnight, but return to normal over time. And um, we'll all have to be, you know, both as people in the industry and people uh, wanting to just consume content, we're all going to have to, you know, roll with the punches and uh, be nimble. Um, because uh, things are going to change numerous times um, before we reach any sort of status quo again. Now, that, that's the last question I actually had prepared, and because you and I both talk a lot. We do. <laughs> we do. I, I was surpri I'm surprised that we blew through this so fast. I'm going to tack one more quick thing on the end. Please. I know that you and we want to give people like the, you know, make, make them feel like they actually watched the panel <laughs> with some substance. So uh, hit me. I do feel like you've been substantial. It's just that we've actually been disciplined, which we usually are not. <laughs> which is very difficult. I know. I can't believe uh, it, actually. What's wrong? <laughs> uh, so the, the thing that occurred to me as you were saying this is, uh, and, and we can disqualify Green Lantern for a variety of reasons, but is there anything else that's in your kind of oeuvre that uh, now that you've had a taste of streaming that you're like, you know what, that could have been fun to do as like a, a, an eight hour prestige project. Ooh. Um, I, you know, I'll tell you, uh, I think Eagle Eye Stone as like an eight hour prestige project with the budget that streaming affords us uh, would be really, really cool. I, I think that would really be something. Um, you know, Greg and I talk about, we were talking about Eli Stone just the other day, huh. um, you know, particularly with respect to Zoe's Extraordinary Playlist, which my daughters absolutely love, um, but uh, I'll watch it and go, hey, wait a, wait, wait a second, and, huh? huh? Oh, and it's even set in San Francisco? Like, down to the, down to the city. Um, <laughs> But, uh, you know, I, I have a great affection, um, you know, for that show. And, uh, you know, it, it didn't come out at the right time. So maybe one day we'll get a chance to, you know, to revisit it again. I think that would be a lot of fun. All right. Well, thank you so much, Mark. It's always a pleasure. Uh, Staying here, man. This was awesome. Thank you for doing this. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Again, I really appreciate it. It's, it's, you know, it's, it's one of those, when, when you have an entire like Arrowverse shrine in your <laughs> office, it's hard to say that I'm not uh, privileged to, to help out. So. <laughs> well, you're a very kind man. I appreciate you taking the time. And uh, these were great questions. So thank you, uh, sir. thanks for, you know, for giving the people uh, something interesting to watch. Absolutely. And thank everybody for, for watching. Uh, I'm sure all. that all of the contact information for myself and Mark and, and some news stories about what he's up to right now are going to be uh, in the post below. So look down there. All right, look down there. All right, thanks everybody.